Good morning. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's event and our uh, latest in our Future Vertical Lift series, focused today on the family of systems aspect of Future Vertical Lift. Uh, I'm going to begin, as we traditionally do, by giving our security announcement. Uh, the good news is we're in a very secure facility here, uh, but if something untoward or unexpected were to happen, <laughs> I'll be your security officer. I'd give you further guidance, uh, either to exit the way you came in or to exit out the back uh, the way we up here on the platform came in, depending on, uh, on the situation. Uh, but I do want to thank you for joining us. And I also want to thank uh, our sponsors for the Future Vertical Lift series, uh, which is Bell Helicopter and Textron, uh, for making it possible for us to dive into these issues uh, in the Future Vertical Lift series. Uh, I mentioned that uh, today's focus is going to be on the family of systems. Uh, for those of you who are diehards, um, we're here for our last event uh, in the fall. Uh, that was on capability set three, which is one of uh, five capability sets that, that are part of the family of systems. And so having dived uh, a little bit deep uh, in that event uh, onto that topic, today we're going to focus at a much higher level uh, at the whole concept of the family of systems. Uh, and how this is going to inform uh, the process going forward in the department to deliver a series of capabilities uh, uh, that, that take on a whole range uh, of multi-role missions uh, that require vertical lift. And perhaps some of those will be missions that haven't traditionally been done by vertical lift, but we'll hear a little bit more about uh, the possibilities there uh, from our, our two guests today. Uh, and now I will introduce them. Uh, to my right is Major General uh, Stacy Clardy, is the Deputy Director for Force Management, Application, and Support on the Joint Staff. Uh, and he is, uh, as you can tell from his uniform, our Marine Corps officer. Uh, he has commanded the 3rd Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion in OEF and OIF, uh, was Commanding General of the Marine Air Ground Task Force Training Command, uh, and also Commanding General of the 3rd Marine Division. So he's got a tremendous background uh, in operations, uh, has uh, a, a bevy of, uh, of degrees from fine academic institutions, including no less than two master's degrees. So thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. And his right is Jose Gonzalez, my former colleague and, yeah. and OSD. We'll, we're not going to hold that against him. <laughs> he is uh, the acting deputy assistant secretary of defense uh, for tactical warfare systems uh, and is uh, the uh, OSD expert on all things uh, land systems and ground forces related uh, to include, in this case, air systems uh, that, that work in the ground component. Uh, he was appointed to the Senior Executive Service in June of 2010. Uh, he oversees major platform and weapon system acquisition and technology advancement uh, in his current role across air, land, naval, and electronic warfare portfolios. Uh, and he entered government service originally at the Naval Surface Warfare Center uh, and also has uh, served in industry. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. They're going to give some, uh, some brief opening comments. We'll do some Q&A here on the panel, and then we'll open up to audience questions uh, with plenty of time for your questions at the end. Uh, Jose, if you, would, if you would like to start. Okay, will do. All right, uh, so good morning, uh, folks. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Andrew, for, and to CSIS and to you for uh, conducting this uh, series of panels on future vertical lift. I had the honor to have uh, been at the kickoff one, two or three years ago. Um, I have watched how we've brought in the, 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 the generals, the PMs, and the PEOs in, in the series that followed, uh, giving you all insights into this very important uh, area. I want to thank the audience, a lot of familiar faces. I've, I've seen many of you all, worked met with many of you all over the last uh, six or seven years. I want to thank our industrial uh, uh, part, industry partners, um, our international partners alike uh, who are with us, and, and clearly all the folks that might be watching uh, over the web. So I, a couple of days ago, I started reflecting a little bit on kind of where we've been uh, with, uh, with Future Vertical Lift. Uh, my involvement, um, at least my observation of, of, of it, uh, goes back to the days of Javadov. So some of you all might remember the Joint Vertical Airlift uh, Task Force uh, that was uh, led by then um, 18L Mike Wynn. Uh, some of you all recall uh, Mike Walsh, who worked in the Land Warfare Office, 
who uh, spearheaded a lot of the Javadov work uh, with Tony Melita as the Deputy Director for Land Warfare Munitions. I observed that, uh, that initiative and that interaction over uh, several years uh, before about 2010, as, as Andrew mentioned, uh, took over the leadership position in Land Warfare Munitions. And around that time, uh, we, we made the conversion over to the Future Vertical Lift Initiative. Um, so my personal involvement uh, as a leader in this, in this area has been for about the last seven years. Uh, when the now uh, Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, General Blue, Bluto Walters, was sitting in your seat. Um, so we've, we've come a long way. There's a lot of things that have been done through the years. I've benefited from the, my Joint Staff uh, counterpart here for, for many years. As they've evolved, they've all brought different and unique and very valuable perspectives uh, to, to, to future vertical lift. So in reflecting on you know, what was our objective then, what's our objective now, and where were the major turning points in, in, in future vertical lift? And I, and I go back to, I want to say there's three. Early on, some of you all might remember, and uh, we used the term joint multi-role to uh, identify the ongoing Army-led uh, tech demonstration activities. Uh, but at one time, we were actually calling ourselves the Joint Multi-Role Program. But early on, as the leadership team looked at that, we, we recognized um, how important the name would be. Uh, joint had a certain meaning. And what we didn't want to pre do is to kind of presuppose strategies. And it kind of leads us to the discussion about, we, we, re we recognized early on that this was going to be a family of systems, a family of capabilities. And maybe, perhaps, there would be multiple role aircraft along the way. And maybe some would be joint, maybe some would be service-led. So we, 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 we made that turn and, and uh, changed our name to Future Vertical Lift. That, that was the first thing, again, uh, up front, not trying to presuppose any acquisition strategy. The other thing we did later on, a couple of years later, for a while we identified the family as light, medium, heavy, and ultra heavy. And to some of us, you know, that, that made a lot of sense. Uh, so early on, that's where we were. Uh, but we rolled up our sleeves, mainly uh, General Clarity in, in your shop, in, in, in the requirements side, and we started really working at a joint level to really understand what missions and capabilities the cross-service uh, services needed. And so we went to this from that, that light, medium, heavy, and ultra-heavy to cap capability sets. So you all now know Future Vertical Lift as being defined as five um, capability sets. So that was another big, big turning point for us. The last um, that I can think of, which is really why we are here today, um, so I had the benefit uh, back in October, November, to have been able to brief uh, then Frank Kendall, Under Secretary of Defense, ATL, for the Cape Set 3 material development decision we made that was a big milestone uh, for, for FEL. Um, we got that decision made, we're off and running, we've got Army lead. Uh, with, with the Marine Corps and SOCOM uh, right there with, with the Army, uh, driving and leading uh, an analysis of alternatives. So uh, along with my um, flag officer uh, uh, partners, um, we sat back and said, all right, now what's next? Did we focus on Cape Set 3? No, we'll let the, the services work on that. So we'll quickly got to thinking, we're scratching our heads and figuring out we really need to focus on the family of systems and what this initiative, the Future Vertical Lift, and I, want to, I almost want to call it a movement more than an initiative, really needs is a focus across the other capability sets. So that's where the leadership is now uh, focused on Future Vertical Lift, and that's why we're all gathered here today. So the objectives and the needs in, in my mind have not changed since those early days of my earlier involvements in uh, Future Vertical Lift. So while I certainly recognize that we enjoy world-class aircraft today, many of them have reached uh, their performance design limits, life cycle costs have become unsustainable, and we're too slow and it's too expensive to upgrade those systems. That has been our objective and our need from day one on future vertical lift, and they're still true today. 
So our message today, and I, I'm joined by my, by my partner, uh, Stacy Clarity, um, is that in vertical lift, in this community, we're lucky if we get a chance every 50 years to do this, to upgrade the capability. We're working in, uh, largely on 70 designs, again, that have reached their design limits. So it's very important for us to do it, and do it, and get it right. So it, it, it comes down to, in my mind, four things. It demands our approach be deliberate, be disciplined, be patient, and that it's collaborative. It really comes down to those four things, folks. That's, the message is pure and simple, and that's what the leadership team in the building, uh, at &L joint staff, uh, the services, SOCOM, the Coast Guard collectively uh, are very focused on. We could rush, but we're not going to rush. The message is very clear. We're going to get one shot at doing this, and we want to get it right. So let me go back to, uh, I mentioned this last time, we have, we have a strategic plan. You all know back, uh, back maybe four or five years ago, Ash Carter signed a strategic plan, and many thought, why, did, why does FVL need a strategic plan? A lot of other areas don't need a strategic plan. But again, it comes down to we only get this chance every once in a while, and you know, every 50 years maybe, if we're lucky, uh, to do this and get it right. So again, a very deliberate, disciplined, and patient approach that's very focused from the, from the get-go. So I, I keep this card uh, in my wallet, and some of you all have, have received one. But what it does is it takes that, I don't know, 60, 70 page strategic plan and boils it down to six uh, st uh, strategic elements. And often when we get together as, as a senior group, we actually start off with this and go down every six elements and, and we ensure that we've got initiatives in the right place, resources in the right place to stay focused on these six elements. So beginning with number one, decision point based plan of execution. So that's a, a lofty way of saying we're looking across all service aircraft. We're looking at the life cycle of the current aircraft. We're determining when they end. And uh, many of you all know for uh, vertical lift uh, aircraft, that end is a little smushy sometimes because we often extend it further and further and further. But nonetheless, we know what our life cycle ends. We back it up in terms of when do we need capability to replace that, and we look across the services, across capabilities, across missions, and deliberately plan for when we need uh, to, to uh, insert a uh, new capability. That's number one. Number two is early joint requirements development. So some of you all know for capability set, uh, three, we had an ICD. It was a very broad ICD. To support the, mouse, uh, the MDD for Cape Set 3, we then uh, created an ICRD, refinement uh, document. So again, early, uh, early involvement at the joint level in the uh, capability area. That's a key element of our strategic plan. Number three, an s and plan that aligns technology development with milestone decision options. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of the ongoing tech demonstration activity that the Army is leading. Very important. It goes beyond that. There's a lot of S&T that we're tracking, that we're ensuring is properly aligned to the capabilities we need. <coughs> Number four, multi-role family of aircraft, which is why we're here. We're talking about a family of systems, and we're, we're talking about a family of systems that satisfies uh, multiple uh, capabilities and multi-role. So again, from the get-go, we envisioned a family of systems, and we have not you know, uh, steered away from that. Number five, common systems, common systems and open architecture. We've, we've envisioned that from the get-go as a means to being able to be more efficient. And again, all of the reasons that I cited as in we need to focus on uh, operation and sustainment. We need to uh, understand how we fight. Um, how uh, we need to understand the logistics implications of that. We need to look for ways that we can leverage uh, new, new approaches in open systems and common systems uh, to address a lot of the needs that we have. And then last but certainly not least is the industry partnership and interaction uh, through the Vertical Lift Consortium, which many of you all have met uh, through, through that mechanism. So those are the six elements. Um, we start off 
thinking in that way. We ensure that we've got the proper uh, leadership and the proper resources and activities going on in, in each of those elements. Uh, we've not veered from that. Um, again, designed up front with, with, with that in mind. So my last uh, uh, message to you before I turn it over to General Clarity, um, what, what am I gonna do? So um, uh, to, to help this initiative moving forward and to, to have this focus on the family system. So as long as I'm afforded the opportunity to sit here, uh, have the honor to, to, to lead this uh, fabulous team, um, I'm going to be engaged, and I'm going to ensure that we have the right uh, uh, attention in all the right areas. So the strategy assumed focused leadership, and General Clarity, I'm sure you, you agree with me. We've got a very vibrant, um, we call it the, the FEL 12-pack. It's modeled after the Army six-pack, uh, aviation six-pack group. Uh, just expanded to include the other services and, and SOCOM and, uh, and the Coast Guard, but a very focused leadership team that gets together on a very frequent basis to help steer uh, FEL. So as long as I'm afforded the opportunity to do that, um, I will do that. Um, we've got the executive steering group, which expands it uh, even beyond that. Uh, we've got ver uh, five uh, very vibrant IPTs, acquisition requirements, s and common systems, and we've just uh, recently started talking about international uh, opportunities. So our job is to ensure we do this right, that those doing the hard work, which is not me, uh, have the resources and support they need to answer and ask all of the right questions, to make all of the right and important trades, and to not rush into this and do it, the, do it wrong. So that's my message today. I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you all and look forward to your questions. Ciao. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, Andrew and CSIS, for giving us this opportunity today to come and speak uh, and talk about uh, Future Vertical Lift. Um, I will tell you up front, and you may already know this, I'm not an, uh, an aviator, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a technician, I'm an instrument. And I've spent my career 33 years in either command or in operations billets associated with your infantry or light arm reconnaissance. Um, but I will tell you that the, whether you're an aviator or a ground officer, um, we all have the same idea about why this is important, why our helicopters and our vertical lift capability are important to our ability to project power, but more importantly about the way in which Americans wage war, support our allies and partners around the globe. Um, I was asked when I first got to the, to the Joint Staff if I wanted to participate in this. They, they talked to me about maybe having somebody else do it, maybe an aviator or somebody else. And I, I uh, after understanding what the, what the effort was about, I adamantly wanted to participate. Um, not because I could add any particular technical expertise, but because I thought from a ground perspective, I could at least offer an operational perspective, not just as a Marine, but uh, across all the services. Um, I think that's borne born out, uh, at least from my perspective, and I'm very happy to be a part of this. Um, I've been very satisfied over the years with our capability for vertical lift, whether mostly helicopters, but also in the case of the Marine Corps, the V-22. Uh, it served us well for the last 75 years, and it's gotten what we needed to be able to do, projecting power, winning our wars, uh, and it's been a big part of what we do and of what I do as a ground officer. Um, back in 1985, I was a young lieutenant with uh, a Marine Expeditionary Unit, Special Operations Capable, the first one. We were trying to expand our repertoire within the Marine Corps about what we could offer to combatant commanders, particularly in crisis response. Uh, we were pushing the envelopes of what then was a CH-46, uh, uh, Cobras and the Hueys, about what we could really expect out of them, particularly flying at night and flying on our goggles. Um, it was very difficult and challenging, but we were able to expand that and it is the foundation for what we do today for crisis response around the globe. Uh, in 2007, I was a regimental commander in Iraq in Alambar province. I had the largest AO there, um, area of operation, about the size of South Carolina. During that time there, the V-22 conducted their first combat deployment, and we partnered up with them, my regiment and the squadron, and we were able to project power all throughout my area of operation around Alambar um, and be able to see the, at least test some of the capability that, that that aircraft would provide to Marines in particular, but also in support of any Joint Force commander. With all that said, though, um, I'm not satisfied. 
there's a big future out there for us uh, within the military, certainly within the Marine Corps, and the world is changing. Uh, we're losing a lot of our dominance in vertical lift. Um, the world, in some cases, it's getting smaller for in ways in which we uh, apply our vertical lift. Uh, our enemies are developing and, and uh, buying capability to make the make uh, the airspace more dangerous for not just fixed wing but helicopters. Um, they wanted to deny us access, and one of our strengths, and certainly as a Marine, and I would say for all our militaries, our ability to project power, both at the operational strategic level, but certainly at the tactical level. I see future vertical lift providing that. It will get us back and help us maintain that dominance uh, in vertical lift. Uh, I do not see any ground force deploying without vert vertical lift capability. It is how we project power on the battlefield. Um, and it's done in multiple ways, many of you know, whether it's in direct fire mode to, to troops on the ground, assault support, moving our forces around the battlefield. Um, it could be in terms of providing CASAVAC or command and control any number of things on the battlefield. But just as important though, it's important that we support our allies and partners. Uh, we do a lot of things for them around the world and to include things like humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. And I will tell you there's nothing more, uh, more rewarding as a commander than to see uh, our servicemen and women uh, going to some place, to some small village somewhere where they need a helping hand and they see a B-22 or a CH-47 land there and offering them some support wherever it might be, whether it be food, medical supplies, uh, or just assistance. Um, and I see Future Vertical Lift being able to do that. What it will provide to us is our ability to thrive in a much more complex battlefield um, and be able to get back to those areas, those complex environments around the globe that we want to project our uh, military force. Um, it could be at altitude, it could be at range, it could be in uh, all numbers of weather or types of weather. It certainly could be uh, low visibility. Um, and as a, as a force commander, um, we want that, we want that the capability for our uh, helicopters and our forces in particular to be able to go anywhere we want them to go and project power where we need to project it. Uh, I feel future, future vertical lift is that effort that allow that to happen. We are only just beginning though. Um, I'm in the requirements business. Uh, as Jose talked about, in terms of requirements documents uh, and CAPE sets, we are just getting started uh, to try to, to define what we expect out of this family of systems. Um, but there's a lot there um, that if we can help a commander on the battlefield, not just about power projection, it's also about resiliency and adaptability and flexibility. The more these systems can work together uh, in concert on the battlefield, they will provide the commander many more options about how they be employed. Uh, whether it's not just within a service at the tactical level, which is an area we generally use our own, we use for Marines, use Marine helicopters and, and vertical lift, the Army uses theirs, but we can see, I can see clearly how we can mesh those together with a joint force and give much more flexibility to an Army commander or a Marine commander or a special operations team or whatever it might be. Uh, certainly from a logistics perspective and mm -hmm. footprints, it'll do the same. Um, that adaptability, that flexibility is a key part of this. It's also, from an operational strategic perspective, our ability to project power, push these assets and, and resources around the world in these large uh, uh, continents and countries where we find ourselves, um, the limitations of the range of our helicopters and vertical lift, we need, to, we need to expand that. And this program looks to, one, certainly increase the speed of them, but more important to me is the range at which we can move these. And if we can aerial refuel all these aircraft, uh, then we can project power to any unlimited ranges and accomplish missions wherever we choose. So with that, uh, I'm prepared to take any questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, I want to start out by uh, digging in a little bit on this issue of, of the family of systems. Uh, and uh, both of your comments kind of made me think about, well, who, who's in the family and who's out of the family? Mm -hmm. um, from a couple of perspectives, one, uh, uh, Jose, you referenced the, the legacy force, mm -hmm. uh, which is substantial and will remain substantial for decades mm -hmm. to come. Uh, and then also, uh, you mentioned the, the 53K, uh, mm -hmm. which I haven't ever thought of as part of future vertical lift, but obviously it's, it's coming online um, now and is kind of um, on a time frame that'll probably still be in procurement maybe when, uh, when uh, the Cape Set 3 is, is getting off the ground. So. Um, how do you scope, I I'm, I'm do study, so I think in terms mm -hmm. of scope, mm -hmm. how do you scope what's, what the family of systems effort is? What does it pertain to? 
Uh, General, you referenced that it's about power projection uh, in the land domain. Uh, and, and there's a lot of things, obviously, that go into that. So how do you, how do you think about scoping what's in the family of systems and what is, uh, you know, you can't have everything in there, so what do you keep, keep in, what's out? Yeah, so let me, uh, let me jump in first, uh, Andrew. So as I mentioned, so we've got a few <coughs> development efforts ongoing right now. We've got the Air Force-led combat rescue helicopter. Uh, we've got the uh, Navy-led presidential uh, helicopter, and we got the Marine Corps-led uh, CH-53K. Um, I think that's where we snap, snap the chalk line. Uh, any developments beyond that are part of the future vertical lift uh, family of systems. Um, again, as I mentioned, element one of the strategic plan was looking across all services, all aircraft vertical lift capabilities uh, would be within the scope of the future vertical lift family of systems. Again, early on defined as the light to the ultra heavy to now more um, capability set focused. And again, gives us, it's a, a little bit more intellectual discussion about how to look at things um, uh, than just a, you know, by, by size, and, size and weight. Um, so I think that, that, that would be the scope. Let me just, uh, what about something like KMAX, you know, which is not different, I guess, fundamentally in terms of speed and range from other systems, but is different in the fact that it's unmanned. I'll tackle, <laughs> Stacey, you want to tackle that one? Go for it. I, I'll tell you from a requirements perspective, yeah. everything's on the table. Yeah. So um, as we look at the different capabilities we're trying to satisfy, as we go through uh, analysis of alternatives that, with each CAPE set, um, I would expect that the services would look at both man and unman as part of that. Um, it's a kind of a gray area because when you start talking about, there's all different efforts regarding just unmanned systems, so um, it could blur into other areas. Sure. But uh, I would expect that they look at all the potential out there in terms of the service level, and to include unmanned. Great. Mm -hmm. um, let me also follow up a little bit, uh, General, on your comments about power projection and how uh, the family of systems, uh, uh, and then tying it, uh, Jose, you, you talked, I guess, about sort of a generational shift, mm -hmm. you know, that, that a lot of the designs that fly today were kind of originally conceived in the 1970s, and, yep. and this is a shift. Uh, of course, we usually talk about generations when we talk, you know, fighter aircraft, and yep. you've got fourth gen, fifth gen, and then, yep. then we get into arguments about, you know, how do you bin them in, in the different buckets, so I don't want to go down that rat hole, yep. but I do want to just get a sense of, um, with this generational shift uh, for power projection uh, to the ground force, uh, what real difference do you see that making? You talked a little bit about ANBAR and the ability to cover more area. Uh, that's with V-22 and, and uh, today's forces. What do you see you know, future vertical lift capabilities really delivering uh, in terms of the, the so what for the future ground force? One of the large, uh, biggest challenges associated with employing uh, vertical lift within a joint force is that every airframe has different flight characteristics, um, range, speed, lift, station time, all that endurance, <coughs> trying to mesh those together into a package that would support um, employing a force uh, at some distance from uh, the main force uh, to envelop the enemy or wherever it might be uh, would, is a huge undertaking mm -hmm. and also a source of a large amount of risk. Um, by having these family of system, having a family of system of aircraft with lots of commonality, we hope, although not the priority effort, with a great amount of interoperability and similar uh, flight characteristics, mm. then the commander has much more uh, flexibility about how that force would be employed. The ground force has much more support available to it, and likelihood of success goes up substantially because of that. Um, and so I see that as a huge benefit about the family systems. Yeah, you, you bring to mind, I recall when, uh, when the 53K was kind of brought on, one of the reasons, I guess, to proceed with it, at least as I understood it, was because the range of V-22 was so substantial, you needed, you needed a left uh, asset for cargo and for uh, logistics that could keep up. Or when, we, when we were employing the V-22 in Iraq in 2007, um, we were, it was employed, we did a couple different types of missions with the V-22, one of them being something called Aero Scout. And 
we mixed in with it, of course, other hel hel helicopters um, as part of the mission set, both 53s, 46s on some occasion, but more uh, the skids like uh, Cobras and Hueys. The different flight profiles of each created all kinds of challenges for the mission commander to try to integrate those. And these missions went on for like eight hours um, where aircraft to be re had to be refueled, uh, each of them being refueled at a different time, different location. Um, it was very complex. Um, it's where your focus as a commander turns into much more into logistics than the actual mission you're trying to accomplish to try to keep all that moving. Uh, not that logistics is not important, it's hugely important, but this will allow a much more um, or less uh, complex logistics tail associated with it and provide, I think, much better support to the commander. Andrew, let me talk a little bit about the, uh, th this next uh, generation. Um, so um, the analysis of alternatives that's, that we've started uh, for Cape Set 3 is going to be very telling, and uh, we're going to track it very closely. Uh, we've set some very lofty goals in terms of range and speed and all the <coughs> illities that we would like in this uh, next generation of, of vertical lift uh, capability. So I think we're going to learn a lot uh, from that AOA, and we're going to take that learning again as part of the family. We're going to apply that learning to the other capability sets. So there's another benefit of looking at this in a, in a family of systems approach is that you don't walk away from things that you learn from one CAPE set to another. Mm -hmm. I'll add one more thing. Um, all the force is looking at a more distributed battlefield. Um, I certainly believe to, and I know from personal experience, but also from our experimentation within the Marine Corps, that if we're going to if we're going to distribute our, our our Marines and soldiers and airmen and sailors around the battlefield, um, whether it's in support of some some other an ally or partner, or whether it's in the fight, that we need uh, to be able to have uh, aircraft. Vertical, air, vertical lift aircraft that can provide the support that they need, both from a firepower perspective, maybe command and control, certainly logistics, um, which what we're expecting from this family of systems in terms of range and endurance, um, I think the, the distributed operations becomes a potential reality for us and a real uh, game changer potentially in our way in which we fight. Let me talk, so we've, we've talked a bit about interoperability, not to suggest we're done with it, because I'm sure we could talk all day about interoperability and, and the, uh, the challenges and the benefits that it provides. Let me talk a little bit on the acquisition side, uh, Jose, about this issue when you have a family of systems um, competition. Uh, and I know one of the goals of, uh, for example, uh, having a MOSA, a, a uh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry to use acronym speak, but uh, the open systems open architecture, systems. modular open system architecture is to enable competition. Um, there's a little bit, I would argue, perhaps at least intellectually tension between Correct. a drive to commonality and a tribe to uh, competition and open architecture. How do you see those balancing out uh, to where uh, you're going to have the ability to do the upgrades, to have comp you know, yeah. a robust market offering you new hardware, but at the same time, commonality. So you're going sure. to have uh, not as much diversity in some parts of the platform right. versus others. Correct. So, so um, there's different levels um, within the architecture of, of something as large as a vertical lift uh, aircraft. So we're going to do the hard work. Uh, that we need to do to figure out at what level does it make sense uh, for the architecture to be open and at what level it does not. Um, we think competition is, is extremely healthy um, between the primes and the, and the sub-vendors um, and, and uh, providing opportunity for sub-vendors to play in, uh, in this space. Um, so um, I think we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, modular and open systems architecture is a very uh, popular uh, theme these days. Uh, the Congress is encouraging us uh, to look at that in the most le recent NDAAs, you know, prototyping, modular open systems. Um, and we're taking that to heart and we're, we're working really hard. But again, it's not a one size fits all and it's not at all levels that it needs to be. So we need to figure out at what level, is it at the bus level, is it at the aircraft level, is it at the rotor you know, level? We don't know at this point. So I think we're going to take that um, and, and we're going to look at that really hard uh, within each CAPE set 
So again, we're not competing the family. We're mm -hmm. going to compete CAPE sets. We're going to compete programs. And we've only got one program out there right now, which is uh, CAPE set 3. So whether um, we may combine CAPE sets along the way um, or not. Uh, but I think a lot of it is what we learned from the AOA, uh, Andrew, and then doing the tough uh, engineering uh, trades that we need to do to figure out uh, at what level we need to, to, to have things open and what level do we need to have things more closed. Yep. Um, let's talk a little bit about timeline. Yep. Uh, always a topic of great interest uh, sure. in Washington. Um, and. Uh, there's obviously a variety of timelines we could talk about. Last time we talked about the timeline for Cape Set 3, uh, but how do you see the timeline for the family as a whole? I don't mean dates of, you know, okay, this Cape Set's on this date, this Cape Set's yeah. on that date, but kind of what is the big picture of uh, the timeline on which you see this, this future vertical lift family of systems fielding, uh, and how does it kind of flow? Yeah. So um, I can tell you that I don't know um, at this point. Um, again, that's, that's, a, that's a level of fidelity, again, driven by the requirements, driven by what uh, the services can afford. A lot of that's going to be driven by that, uh, that Andrew. Uh, we certainly would love to see all CAPE sets moving out tomorrow, uh, but that's probably <laughs> not likely uh, in our current fiscal environment. Again, the services have to define the requirements. Uh, and the services have to have the resources to uh, to make those investments. So at this point, um, we feel uh, uh, good that we've got Cape Set three out. I know we're looking at Cape Sets one and two. We know we have needs in the in the four and five range, uh, but I can't um, tell you right now what kind of timeline we're working on. Um, each of the services, obviously, with their portfolios of aircraft. Um, have plans for those aircraft in terms of when they'll sunset. Mm -hmm. Some will be extended, of course. They have to weave that together with their budget and what their needs are, and that will somewhat determine as we go forward what that timeline looks like. So we can look at, you can look across the fleet of, I think it's 6,500 aircraft, and see how those aircraft will sunset. And uh, the services will have to orchestrate that uh, within this, with each service. The challenge, I think, from a joint perspective, and although this is not a joint program technically, mm -hmm. at least that's not what we're calling it, is that they have to weave them together, the other services who have equities in that particular CAPE set, yeah. so that they align. Um, again, we're, we're early in the process. Um, there's always fiscal uncertainty as well that has to be addressed and, and thought about. There are programs as Jose was talking about that are already still underway that they are also um, uh, want to protect certainly and support as they go forward and may be their priorities at this point. So, um, but this is a long-term long-term effort. Uh, uh, that was intentional from the start mm -hmm. to take a long-term view. Uh, these legacy aircraft will be part of the uh, uh, part of the I would argue part of the future vertical lift because what we learned from this effort will go into the legacy aircraft to allow for a hybrid fleet going forward. Um, and I think that'll make those aircraft even more capable, of course, than the ones we currently have in the inventory. And uh, this is a, and I, I like the fact that we're trying to mature some of the ideas, some of the technology as before we go forward to make sure we know what's in the realm of the possible, not trying to reach too fast. Yeah, it's, it strikes me. I know um, uh, I spent a lot of time on acquisition reform. There's more studies on acquisition reform, perhaps, than in almost any other topic on earth. But uh, one of the, one of the uh, recommendations that, uh, uh, I would say Larry Welch, I believe, was the one who put forward was for to do development planning, which was which is a term that I think only the Air Force really used, mm -hmm. and then there weren't a lot of people around who really understood what it meant. But but in essence, it basically means thinking through big picture on the front end. What are the different things you have to develop and bring together uh, for systems to work together, uh, and how do you phase it? And it sounds to me like that's very much what the family of systems is is providing. The challenge, of course, with that is like any program that goes on for a long period of time is that. Um, Priorities may change, yeah. um, and something that started out as a Chevy will turn into a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you, you reference I, I made a reference earlier today to, uh, to another program. Uh, I'm going to follow up almost all the examples that I have today are, are Marine Corps examples, so I think I'm just being subconsciously influenced by the uniform. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> my question relates to the risks and opportunities for future vertical lift. Yeah. Uh, and just the, the example that I'm going to use, I, I recall, I'm maybe getting in the way back machine, but when, uh, 
when General Jones was the commandant and came to see one of my former bosses on Capitol Hill, uh, he said, uh, you know, the critical risk, and he was speaking about F-35 and particularly the B variant, he said the critical risk is it, it can't be a gimmick. It has to be an operationally relevant, operationally viable uh, Stovall aircraft. And so the risk obviously was that it, that it wouldn't be operationally uh, effective and viable from that approach. I think, I think we've achieved his goal on that one, but what do you see uh, with, with future vertical lift as the, kind of the key opportunities and the key risks uh, that you're gonna keep your eye on to kind of judge these, uh, the AOA results, the, yeah. you know, the designs as they come forward? Yeah, my, my responses will be uh, more in terms of you know, business and process and, and resources. Certainly the, the, um, uh, the general mentioned uh, priorities, threats, uh, changing those those are those are areas that that will impact uh, plans um, resources I've already mentioned how, how those will vary mm -hmm. uh, over time uh, certainly oppor opportunities uh, the opportunities are in uh, using vertical lift to do things that we haven't really even thought of doing with them and and their opportunity there is as we do this analysis is to see what is the art of the possible how can we use these uh, aircraft in, in new and, and novel ways uh, but the risks are, are many um, i think we have the best and the brightest uh, industry uh, partners uh, that are way out in front of us and working with us in terms of building the skills that are required to do the, the, the technical work that needs to be done. So I think that's, a, that's an opportunity that we're trying to leverage right now is to uh, capitalize on our industrial partners, uh, technical capabilities, because I know you guys want it uh, just as bad as we do. And um, you've demonstrated through, through the work that you've done uh, a capability to do it. So I think that's a, that's a huge opportunity that we have. But again, the risks are, are many. Uh, from, from threats to, to, to financial, fiscal, and, and affordability uh, writ large? Um, I'm involved with a lot of it because of my uh, responsibility with the joint staff. I'm involved with a, large, a lot of large programs across all the services. <coughs> um, I don't see any that are structured the way this one is. Mm -hmm. um, I've asked that question several times with my staff and with mm -hmm. Jose, and I have not seen one like this before. I'm very impressed by the people who are involved directly, whether they be industry, uh, within the joint staff, certainly with OSD, um, and their interest in making this successful. Uh, it is truly a coalition of the willing. Um, it's not a joint program, it's an effort. And I actually believe that's the strength of it, that people see the value this might bring to their services, to their units, to the, to the, to the department, to a joint force commander, uh, to our allies uh, and our partners. Um, there's a lot of potential here. Uh, I believe there's a potential for a revolution, revolutionary way in which we employ vertical lift with this. I don't know what that, I could not define that right now, mm -hmm. but with, it, with this type of potential for technology leap, potentially then you have the option or the opportunity maybe to make a change in which we, how we look at vertical lift, how it's employed with the ground force. Um, that's not a requirement specifically, but I certainly see that as, as a potential opportunity. Um, challenges are many, as yep. Jose said. Uh, it's always difficult to sustain an effort <laughs> within the department um, with the same energy. I've been, but I've been, uh, I see a lot of uh, stick to itness with this particular one as people go forward. I see that, uh, as, as Jose said, it's been going on for a while. Uh, I think things are in place to allow it to continue out to the future. Um, but again, it's going to have to be the will of the people involved to keep, uh, keep with it because we will have challenges, there will be friction, and we just have to be willing to overcome that friction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've come to that time where I want to open up to uh, audience questions. Uh, this is always a high grade audience uh, on this topic, so I look forward to your questions. If you raise your hand, uh, we'll, come, we'll start here on the front and then we'll work back. If Mike is coming. Sir, George Nicholson, uh, Washington Liaison of the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. I was the lead analyst for the development of the CV-22 for the U.S. SOCOM. You sort of alluded to it earlier, but about aerial refueling. Uh, are the Army assets or any of the assets, because what kind of impact is that going to have on a need to grow the number of tankers that can refuel all of these? And the other point is, right now in SOF, right now, 
any of our 160th assets, we can have them any place in the world within 24 hours because they can be airlifted either inside of a C-5 or a C-17. What are you looking at a metric for a requirement for any of the variants to be airlifted? Uh, Thank you for the question. Every, every, everything you say is, is certainly true. Um, from my perspective, though, if you look at a large joint force, trying to move any force in 24 hours, a large force, is very challenging. And lift becomes the limiting factor to allow that to happen. Um, if these aircraft within this family of systems is self-deployable, uh, then that alleviates and allows for more, capa more capability to go someplace else, more lift to go somewhere else uh, for uh, moving the troops or moving logistics or whatever it might be. So it'll free up and makes, make us more operationally uh, agile. Uh, regarding tanker support, uh, that is certainly something we must consider as part of this. I can't uh, specifically comment on whether we have the appropriate number of tankers to support this type of effort, and particularly in support of vertical lift. Um, but that certainly will be taken into account uh, as we develop and go forward. I also see, though, that there are more than just tankers that can refuel. Uh, we're experimenting in other areas to, to see how we can self uh, use vertical lift to actually refuel other vertical lift aircraft. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, back here and just off the center aisle. Thank you. Uh, Jose, uh, yeah. it, I'm Mike Hirschberg from uh, American Helicopter Society International. Uh, Jose, thanks for your leadership over the, the years. And uh, my question is really about, as, as mentioned, acquisition reform. So we have the, the JMR demonstrations that are going to do a lot of risk reduction. Uh, you know, how, do, how does, you know, how can industry, you know, uh, the individual companies also through uh, the Vertical List Consortium, how can we address acquisition reform, get credit for JMR for future uh, for the for the next milestone, so we don't have to, you know, waste taxpayers' money of of repeating uh, repeating tests. And you know, what what can industry do to help uh, alleviate some of the statutory or regulatory requirements for, that are really a waste of money? Yep. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're going to get a lot of credit for for JMR, but it it certainly goes beyond uh, the work that's going on. Uh, in JMR. So we've looked at JMR as a strong risk reducer, schedule reducer, uh, hopefully a fiscal uh, uh, reducer as well. Um, specifically on what uh, kinds of things we could ask uh, of you uh, for relief on, I, I don't have any uh, right now. I think we have all the latitude that, that we need uh, to embark on uh, these CAPE sets uh, with the given uh, statutes and regulations that we have and the flexibility uh, that our Congress and, and, and our leadership ha has provided, um, we, we can do this. We really can. And um, again, I, I'll, I'll foot stomp uh, industry in, in this space. I mean, and certainly we, we in the building can take a lot of credit for the unity and, and the leadership and all that, but that has not... Um, we have not been alone and through the vertical lift consortia and the interaction that we've had with you all and you all leaning forward in in this space in particular uh, getting out uh, in front of 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 this and uh, demonstrating at the element level as well as at the system level i mean we can't ask for anything more we can't ask for having a better uh, industry partner than one, than the one that we have uh, in in this vertical lift uh, community so thank you Over here on uh, Sydney. <laughs> I am now a geographical referent, apparently. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, for those of us, uh, myself included, who might be not engineers, uh, but rather uh, poor lost humanities majors, can you describe what the five Cupidia sets actually consist of at this point? You know, how they're different from each other? It's obviously not as simple as big and little, which we humanities majors could handle before. Uh, and where they stand in the process from Cape Set 3 actually <coughs> moving far, fairly far along to there's a more sort of nascent stage of development. Yeah, so somewhere I have a chart that, that kind of lays out uh, each of the Cape Sets. I don't know if that's been made available publicly. Um, it has not. 
Uh, but within that, it's, it's, again, it's, it's different, as I mentioned, than the, just the physical size, which I think that was a good place to start. Um, <coughs> but as I mentioned, we roll up, roll up our sleeves and really look hard at what kinds of missions um, the, the services uh, individually and collectively need to meet. And those CAPE sets were, were defined in that way. I, I, don't, I can't ramble them off the top of my head. General, I don't know if you can in terms of the defining each of the CAPE sets. Um, I'm not sure I want to take a stab at all five. <laughs> um, yeah. But generally, they, they run, if you think about what our current fleet looks like today, I hate to use that because that's not really what we're doing, but um, in terms of reconnaissance aircraft up to the heavy lift aircraft and look at the different uh, capabilities, each of those family of or types of helicopters or vertical lift uh, assets we have, that generally will align with some of these CAPE sets. Uh, but they're also more specifically aligned to mission sets. Um, at the top of the, at the, top of the uh, Cape Set 5, you're looking at, at the, um, uh, more of the logistics, heavy lift. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom, you're looking at the light aircraft that provide reconnaissance and scouting. Uh, and then it goes through attack and then assault support up through the last three sets, I think, are really about, last three sets are really about so, uh, some type or some form of assault support. You have to remember that each of these are designed to support different um, mission sets, not just for a particular service, but for all the services. So the goal was to combine uh, and try to see if there's, there's enough uh, commonality in terms of requirements and mission sets from each of the services. So each has a list of mission sets, but they are all specifically um, uh, articulated in a way that they support the needs of the each individual services. So whether it be a CAPE set one or a CAPE set three or a CAPE set five, who are the actual stakeholders from the services who, have, who believe they have some stake in that and then their requirements are listed out in it. And those lists are fairly lengthy actually for each of the CAPE sets. Uh, let's come here and then I'll come back across. So. Make sure we get this side of the room. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Colonel Buis, I'm military attaché of the Netherlands Embassy. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, you touched upon international opportunities uh, very briefly. Sure. Can you ex explain a bit more how we as allies can participate? Sure. So we're, as I mentioned, we're, we're starting to do that. We, we certainly know we are going to go uh, in that direction uh, with, with, this, with this capability. Um, in my, in my new role uh, as the, uh, as the uh, Director for Tactical Warfare Systems, I've begun to start learning what we've done on F-35 and appreciate, beginning to appreciate uh, the benefits as well as the additional complexity that, that comes along with, uh, with uh, having international partners uh, there with you. So um, we're in our early stages. Um, I mentioned that we've started up uh, a new IPT, uh, integrated product team focused on how we can begin uh, uh, the, the right uh, dialogue with our international, and you mentioned our ally partners and the importance of our ally partners in this. And, um, you know, vertical lift aircraft is a vertical lift aircraft. You have them, I have them, we're going to have them together, we're going to deploy them together. Uh, so it only makes sense um, to get engaged in that as early as we can. Um, we probably could have got engaged even earlier, but I think now's the time, especially as we're embarking on Cape Set 3 uh, and, and beginning to look at our AOA is, is, again, bringing in our international partners into how we can work together with you. So I think it's premature for me to tell you how we're going to do that yet. Um, but as I mentioned, as the leadership team here, it's our job to make sure we've got the right uh, set of people engaging in the right way. Uh, to lay out a plan for us to execute in terms of how we begin to uh, establish our international uh, partnerships. I would, also, I would also say from a requirements perspective, we're not so far down the road that once we, we will partner mm -hmm. uh, with uh, any number of international, uh, see any international uh, uh, countries, potentially companies as well, um, who might have a vested interest in what we are doing, but I don't see the requirements set so, so much in concrete right now that we can adapt and adjust and take inputs in from those partners as we go forward. So uh, we look forward to that um, partnership. Can, can I ask a, a question to you? So are, are you engaged now at the element level, at the S&T level at all with, with the DOD? 
services now? Okay, because my understanding is there is a fair amount of activity, international activity at the element and at, at the S&T level. Um, but certainly we, we look forward to the opportunity to do it at the, at the platform level. Okay. And at the risk of repeating myself, because I think I may have said this before, but we are planning an event on the international aspects oh. of future vertical lift as part of the series. Good. So, so keep, keep, your, uh, keep tuned for that. Uh, let me come to the back here, and then I'll come back uh, out of, I think that's auto if I'm. <laughs> Hi, uh, Yasmin Tajday with National Defense Magazine. I wanted to ask if there's a timeline for when the AOA will be wrapped up, when that will be disclosed publicly, some of the requirements coming out of that. And then also to kind of push, uh, to push a little more on the international aspect, um, is there any particular countries that you think might be particularly aligned to help with this? And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Australia was going to have something to do with future vertical lift. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... Yeah, it's, it's, it's too, too early to discuss um, uh, particular uh, arrangements with, with, the, with the various countries. You mentioned the timeline for the AOA. Uh, was that uh, in the area two to three years? Late, late 18, early 19 is, is, is when we'll uh, wrap, start wrapping up the AOA and have uh, initial findings to, to inform the leadership in terms of which way we're going to go. All right. Here on the aisle. Good morning, Otto Kreischer, Sea Power Magazine. Kind of a question on timeline and family of systems. Each of the services has kind of a, a different problem. With the, fact the Marine Corps has been doing, doing around, they've uh, updated their light attack and light lift. They've uh, pretty good on the medium with the uh, Osprey. And if the 53K comes through, you know, you've got a, a leap ahead on uh, heavy. The Army has been you know, incrementally improving both its Apaches, its uh, UH-60s, UH and its um, uh, Chinooks. But, you know, so the question is, if you're going to do the family system, are you looking at any specific mission set that probably will have the greatest need down line? You know, even with the uh, Chinooks and the uh, 53K, we really don't have uh, a, a good heavy lift that can you know, you know, do transplant Atlantic or, 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 the, or the green long reach without uh, in-flight in refueling. You know, any specific part of the family that may have a priority? Well, <laughs> the easy answer is Cape Set 3 is the, because that's the one that's come to come first. Correct. Um, based on what the services, I think, their inputs and what they wanted. Uh, so we see that as being the first. Certainly each of the services has different timelines about when their aircraft uh, either have been replaced or when they've been updated. That is being considered as part of the process uh, and worked through by the services. Uh, in particular with Cape Set 3, I know the Marine Corps has worked that out uh, with the Army. They, have, uh, they know ex pretty much how they see these, uh, these particular vertical lift capabilities will come online and how they're going integrate to integrate that in with their own fleets. So they are considering it. Uh, with, I can't get into the specific details. I, I understand what you're saying, the challenges of doing that, but the services are able to work through that. Um, there are some places where it's difficult to make the connection, so there will be compromises um, about that, and there's going to have to be. Hard decisions will have to be made at some point uh, as we go forward, particularly on Cape Set 3, once the AOA is done and they start talking about the, the specific requirements, you know, the there's going to be hard decisions that have to be made if this is going to stay together as a capability, uh, uh, capability that the joint force will have. Yeah, and, and clearly needs and numbers clearly went in and was factored as part of Cape Set 3, a decision on Cape Set 3 early on. Uh, but it, but it's, more, it's more difficult than that, more challenging than that. And, and early on, I, I mentioned, it's not like I want to stay away from the word joint, but we are looking at this uh, across the services and trying to figure out where's our biggest bang for the buck uh, in terms of where can we make investments, where can we make them together, uh, where can we get capability informed by technology, informed by lessons learned, uh, informed by needs, and, and ultimately you know, what we can afford and what we need. So, it, it, and I, the thing that impresses me most, uh, from my standpoint, is um, it really comes down to whether they're going to put the money into it or not. Yeah. And so far, they have. 
uh, each of the services and uh, Marine Corps included have put the money that was needed to ensure the success of the program as it's sure. going forward. So they're all, they're all putting the money up. They believe this is important and they're going to put the money up for it. I follow up on that because, uh, Jose, I think when you talk about it, it's not a joint program, so it's not like, say, F-35 where you've got mm -hmm. an A, a B, a C variant and the services have signed up on the front end and say we're right. buying X number of X variant. Yep. Here you've got a much more open arrangement. Correct. So. And this may just be my fevered imagining, but is it is it possible that you would see, you know, a service? I won't pick mm -hmm. a candidate, but a service could say, you know, we may not want to buy Cape Set Four, Correct. but there may be things in Cape Set Four Correct. that we could backfit onto our legacy fleet, uh, yep. you know, in terms of, you know, some sub element. Absolutely, uh, Andrew. So again, that's that's why we consciously up front uh, made that deliberate approach not to lock ourselves into any particular strategy. Mm -hmm. We want the services making those decisions based on their needs and what they can afford. And we could see where they could learn something out of you know, one initiative and they may just backfit that into their current aircraft because that's, that's gonna be what they wanna do. So we've consciously uh, opened ourselves up mm -hmm. uh, and have not prescribed up front any particular strategy for this family of systems effort and, and we're open. And again, the services ultimately are making, making the calls here. It's their money, it's their requirement. So, well, we have come to the end of our hour, so uh, I want to thank the audience very much for attending. As I mentioned, we are planning another event uh, tentatively in May uh, for the next Future Vertical Lift series event. I uh, look forward to seeing you all there, and please join me in thanking uh, our guests today. Thanks. Thank you. All.